the next one is Alva Monteiro from Farfetch. He's going to talk a little bit about the Swift language, which uh, is around uh, here in almost a year. So we're going to know a little bit about it. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Alva Monteiro. I'm a senior iOS developer at Farfetch. And I come here today to talk about Swift. It's a new program, one year old programming language from Apple. Um, how many among of you are iOS developers or Mac developers? And how many have programmed in Swift? Okay, cool. I think you're online. I know. No, it's okay. It's okay. Well, not so bad. Hopefully, at the end of this presentation, you guys will be more curious about Swift and all those things. Well, while preparing this uh, presentation, I had a real challenge because uh, you have the Objective-C community, you have a bunch of people that have program, programmed in Apple platforms, and in this presentation I have, well, I think I have to cater for all those people. So uh, hopefully this will not be, this presentation will not be an example of jack of all trades, master of none. Apple says that with Swift, you should be able to do something really simple from a hello world to program a whole operating system. And they also say it's the first industrial quality systems programming language that is as expressive and enjoyable as a script language. I don't even, I don't know, whatever that means. But hey, one thing is for sure. This is the next language for Apple's platform. This is the language uh, they are pushing forward and that they want everyone to start programming when they program for their own platforms. You know, especially for Objective-C developers, they were like, one year ago, what is that? Swift? Objective-C without the C? I don't, know. I don't know. What's happening? Apple moves so slowly and all of a sudden they have a whole new programming language. You know what? The writing was on the wall all the time. Mac OS 10.4, iOS, iOS 0.5, we had the introduction of blocks. All of a sudden we had those, all those things that the cool kids had. Closures, anonymous functions. Dot notation, people still discuss that in the Objective-C community. They think it overshadows messaging. But you already have it. Literals. Yep, on JFTC, we, we had really tough times. We didn't have any choice until three, four years ago. And I don't know if you've noticed, especially for the iOS developers, using automatic reference counting, we started losing some diamonds. But we didn't care because we helped from memory management. And all these things are much more subtle and much better, and they're basically built in in the Swift language. However, I've been noticing for the past year there are some misconceptions. One of those is that Swift is a weekly type language. Well, it's not. Uh, when you look at code, sometimes it looks like that, but it isn't. Basically, it infers, the compiler infers the type. So it allows for a shorter code and more readable. Other people think because of the syntax, it looks like a bit of JavaScript or some kind of interpretive language, it's not. It uses the LLVM infrastructure that Apple is a big fan. And uh, it uses a different front end from the Objective-C. Instead of a client, it's just a Swift front end. And it basically compiles to uh, LLVM interp um, intermediate representation and then to machine code, depending if it's an Intel, x86, AI, whatever. And another misconception is that it's easier than Objective-C. I know why you all think that, because when you look at code, I don't know, it's no square brackets, all of that. Well, before we get to that, Swift versus Objective-C. First of all, no more diamonds. If you're using it in Objective-C, you're gonna have a hard time. No root class, that's kinda cool. Everything in Objective-C has been hired from NS object. Or, there are some other exceptions, let's not get it. It's not a superset of C, yay. Really cool, huh? 
a lot of safety, a lot safer, and safety is the mantra that Apple is talking about for Swift. And no more messaging. Yay, not so good. Actually, I really like the messaging model in Objective-C. Well, okay. In a way, it's easier than Objective-C. No more this duet in this strange dance between IVARs, instance variables, and properties. The usage of those little weird things all other developers look at. What is that? Square brackets. Who came up with that? No need for two files and interface H and implementation in that. So basket, right? Well, a lot less craft world for simple tasks. We Objective C developers, we 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 have a hard time. Interpolation of strings, concatenating strings, whatever. Simple stuff that in any, any other language are it's so easy. And in Objective C it just gets in the way. No more. Swift solves that. There's no more import statements like in C or C or Objective C inside the same project. Super cool. Well, if you, especially if you come from Objective-C or from other languages, like Ruby, JavaScript, Python, uh, there are some stuff that it might be quite new. One of them is generics. Uh, anyone from .NET and Java world, they're okay with that. That's okay. We have optionals which is a new way to deal with nil, <coughs> nil pointers, and value types and reference types. What about generics? So, for those among you from interpretive languages or even from Objective-C, it's really great to write reusable functions that basically work with any type and can return any type. And uh, the compiler is responsible for type safety. It basically shifts the burden of checking types from the developer to the compiler. Really cool. Optionals. What about optionals? This is entirely, in my opinion, as far as I know, new construct in Swift. Which basically everything, everything must have a value. No more what I'm going to do with this method and just send a nil and see if it works. No. You have, you have three parameters you have to fill in. You have to fill them in. But in the real world, that doesn't happen so often. So there's a, this construct called options that uh, you're basically saying, I can be new. And it works for any type, not just classes. It's really cool. Gonna, let me give you an example. I have the, here the class address. has a name, which is a string, a street name, which is an optional street, a question mark over there. And uh, to build a new instance of, of address, you, I have an initializer. And it basically says what initializer is telling the consumer of this class is that the name must be a string. There's no way it can be a nil. No way, because I'm not an option. It's not an optional, okay? And street name, it is an optional. So it can be a nil. It's okay. So this is really, really cool in order to convey messages, convey a message of the APIs to other developers. Especially if you if you're building a framework or whatever, it's, just, it's really, really cool. You don't have to document and just say, oh, no, 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 you can send a nil here. Oh, in this case, you cannot, but no. No more documentation like that. It's self-documented. It's really nice. Uh, the construct that Apple came up with to check optionals is this, optional binding. Just if like equals address dot street name, and if it's not nil, you can use it. If it's not, if it's nil, it just goes on. Value types and reference types. Well, it's not hard. Look at me. Forget the goal. Imagine a person. Her name is Jane. Everyone knows Jane. Everyone in this room knows Jane. And Jane changes her name to Mary. And everyone is aware of that. Why? Because it's a reference. Okay? So everyone has a reference to, to that person. And it just basically changes its name. But if it's a value type, as a, and in Swift, value types can be structs or enums, it's different. It's basically like in any other language, like a, an integer. What does it happen? A equals B, A equals 1, B equals A, B is 1. But if you change the value of A, you won't change the value of B. And you can have powerful constructs for that, just like in classes. 
but with structs, with properties, protocol implementation, all the things except inheritance. This is really, really cool when you just want to share data between your methods and you don't want multiple ownership. Well, I think everyone has this problem, right? Well, I certainly have. My team certainly have mutable state, right? So, one cool, one cool thing about Swift is that Apple is trying to push several things in the language. It's not forcing upon the developers to use uh, one paradigm versus the other, but it's trying to create a set of tools that you ha can have on your belt in order to, you know, depending on the problem, know how to fix it. By saying this, Swift definitely favors immutability. It's not a new thing for Mac and iOS developers. We had, we already had um, immutable data structures. That wasn't enough. We, okay, we had NS strings, NS numbers, UI image, all those sort of things. But Swift allows for immutability on any kind of type. Just use a left keyboard. Don't use a bar, just use a left, and it's immutable. Really cool for threading, really cool for everything that you just don't have to change and you're afraid that someone changes. You know, be usual. I just wish that in Swift were like a bit like F sharp, where everything is immutable, and if you want to make it mutable, you have to set it clearly in the code. That would be awesome. Well, anyway, uh, the compiler now in Swift 2.0, uh, it tells you if a var doesn't change, perhaps you should change it to left. So it's, it's, a, it's a cool thing. Like for people that are used to imperative language, declarative languages, and not used to, to immutability at all, uh, it's really nice that it starts to instill this, you know, this process, this way of thinking, like, try to think about immutability. So that's, that's really cool. And uh, a, let, uh, a let, a constant, can only be accessed after it's been initialized, otherwise it's a compiler error. Once again, a lot safer. Functional programming. Well, it's not new, okay? Functional programming guys are always telling us that they've been here since the 70s, and it's the next big thing is functional programming, and only now we are waking up for the virtues of functional programming. Uh, Swift is just like Objective-C, it's an object-oriented language. However, it gives us the tools and, uh, to, to use functional programming when necessary. For that, three main points. Higher level functions, receives functions as parameters, as well, they use closures, and the Swift standard library it also includes several things: map, reduce, transform, <coughs> filter. Enums. Well, in Objective C and in many many other languages, what are enums? Basically, integers in disguise, right? Nothing else, nothing more. In Swift, enums uh, are types themselves. Okay. They can have computer properties, instance methods, the works. So it's, 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 it's a whole new ballgame, really. Because you can have really specific types that will only work in your methods in the right way. It's just not something in the skies when you have integers. So here's a, it can be basic raw value and associated enums. This is a pretty simple um, enum. Mushroom genus, three cases, that's it. What you used to see, but they are types by themselves, not integers. How many times do you want to give values to your enum to enrich the information of your enum? Well, now you can in Swift with raw values. It must be literals, strings, integers, and uh, other, other types, but basically you can set. As you can see here, then I can extract, for instance, a common name. I can extract the raw value. I know what it is. Really cool. And uh, once again, about options. I can build an enum. I can have one type, specific type, with the, and setting the raw value. If that raw value exists, okay, the option will be set. It won't be nil. If it doesn't, it will be nil. So the Swift language already expects that, and that's why the member initializer of enums force it to be optional. A whole new associated data game. You can associate data to enums. So for instance, here, 
I have a raw value in it, mushroom edibility, edible, not edible, toxic, deadly. Then species, and the species has a description, each one of them. And it also has a uh, edibility, which is in itself an inner. And I can check things. I can see, I can, I can switch and, and check cases depending on the description, depending on the, and on, on the edibility of each one of them, and extract the values and extract what it means. Tuples. Well, tuples are uh, it's basically grouping multiple values into a single compound value. Uh, it's really great for temporary data. It's really great if you want a function that you just want to return stuff and you want to return this huge chunk of information but you don't want to create a structure or a class for it. Uh, but it has one problem in my opinion. Uh, sometimes it destroys the single responsibility principle of a function. It basically returning a whole bunch of things that are not associated at all with each other. So you should avoid that. But anyway, use it wisely and it's really great. Pattern matching. Well, Erlang guys, they're going to say we had this for a long, long time. Okay, that's okay. Uh, I'm just going to give you two small examples of pattern matching. Imagine you have an animal, which is a dog, a cat. I would say, okay, it's a string. Let's imagine it's a five. An eight, it's a switch. So it's just switch to it. And, okay, this will print it's an eight years old cat. But imagine it was something else between 14 and 20. So you can, you can use ranges for matching. You can, uh, you can use underscore for saying, I don't care if it has its age. I don't care about its type. So it has a lot and a lot of possible combinations. Just another one. Really contrived example here. Just an array of one, two, three, four, five. And I just want to compute, I just want to cycle through this array. Uh, and uh, I don't want to check anything inside the array. I just wanted to deal with numbers higher than two. And I just put where number bigger than two. Another thing that is really close to my heart. Swift favors protocols over inheritance. We all know the problems with inheritance. It gives us a, it gives us a lot of advantages. Uh, polymorphism, sharing, uh, methods between all those different types. But there's a lot of baggage associated with it. And, so, and sometimes you just want to inherit it for a simple thing and then you've got the whole thing that is super classified. Everyone can use it, all constructs that can both data and Swift can use it, classes, structs, and elements. Want to print something about an instance? Implement the bot printer. Want to use a dictionary literal? Just implement dictionary literal convertible. Want to, get, want to implement your own data structure and you want to use a foreign loop? Just implement single style. And there's a new cool thing in Swift 2.0, which are protocol extensions. Basically, uh, you can implement default implementations for the protocols that you implement. And you can use pattern matching, matching as well. Say, okay, this extension only applies if you implement as well equatable protocols. It's really, really nice. Uh, I've read recently that uh, this is, uh, this, in a way, it's different from object-oriented. I think it's even more object-oriented. It's basically, you don't have the, all the mess with inheritance. You, you, you just can put pieces together. You have one type, and you just, okay, I want this behavior. So I want this protocol. Okay, I want this other behavior. I want this protocol. I don't want all the other behaviors. It's okay. Just don't get it. Just don't implement that. Well, Swift in production, or in real life. Uh, your mileage may vary. Uh, this is my very, very personal opinion. But take into account time constraints, especially if you're an Objective C developer. It's the first time for many years, well, actually, since I got out of college, that I've seen people struggling, struggling with a compiler. Really, really funny. People like, oh, it's okay, it's just another language. Two days and it's like writing a bike. No, it's not. Don't fight it. Just follow Bruce Lee's advice. Be water, my friend. It's going to be okay. Take into account dependencies, okay? Uh, there are a lot of libraries uh, within Swift. They are really cool, and they are really cool if you check them. 
especially if they are open source, uh, to understand how the developers got around some new problems and how they leverage Swift to, um, to implement uh, stuff. But uh, since the language is developing so fast, uh, sometimes those dependencies stop working if you're using the latest version. So you should be careful of that. I really think that with Swift 2.0, things are stabilized. Okay, but in the past year, it has been a, it has been one of the Swift developers' pains. Tools are definitely maturing, but they are not just there yet. At least compared to Objective C, debugger is slow, debugger crashes. It's not like in the, in the beginning. In the beginning, everything crashed because it didn't work. But now it's just really good. But not just there yet. Playgrounds. Playgrounds are amazing. It's basically, playgrounds uh, just a window where you can put in some uh, subset of Markdown and code, and it executes, and you can see the results. It's really cool to, to experiment with Swift, and it's especially cool because you can use it among your teams or inside your team in order to share code and logic and just explaining algorithms. Whatever. Another thing, you can mix Objective-C and Swift. It's getting better and better and better. Actually, Objective-C is getting better because of Swift. Now you can see the tendency that I, that I said in the beginning. Uh, you have non-nullables and nullables in Objective-C just to, so that there's a relationship one-to-one -one with, um, with optionals, uh, generics, all that kind of stuff. So, futurists of Swift. As I said at the beginning of the presentation, I really do believe that um, uh, Apple is pushing Swift as a programming language for its platforms. And uh, you can see I strike through because I, I prepared this presentation before the WWDC. So one of my points in my wish list were open source Swift. They, they're going to open source it. Uh, like here you're going to have all the compilers and tools chains and Mac OS and Linux, probably in Windows, I don't know, next year. So that's really cool. Let's see what we get. Swift on sales, I don't know, programming, I don't know, there was this presenter this morning talking about Google material in, in iOS, perhaps Swift and Android, I don't know, who knows. A new concurrency model, I would wish that. We're still using Objective-C, print self dispatch, all that sort of things. Uh, it's not bad, but it's not modern. And I think that since Apple is trying to move forward with a new language, why not just get rid of the old things and put in place a new comparison model? More dynamism. Reflection has improved in Swift, in Swift 2.0, but it's not there yet. If you write a lot of DSLs and if you use a lot of dynamism, Objective-C is still better. React style of programming, I don't, I don't mean React as in itself, but since we, once again, since we're building a new language, since Apple is building a new language, and so in being so open about it, why not make a new way to build UIs? Better tooling, definitely, and definitely better support and widespread use of Swift as a command line tool. Me, myself, I, uh, whenever I want to write a command line tool, I want to go to Swift, but I always fall back to Ruby, and that's because it's not just there. I think this uh, quote from Chris Latner is really, really important. Uh, basically, I think this reflects the, the attitude that Apple is having towards Swift. It's basically, this is a journey, it's an ongoing thing. It's not a black box. On the contrary, I mean open source. And they are expecting people to give feedback. If you're interested, I would advise you guys to subscribe to Apple Developer Forums. And you can even subscribe the responses of Chris Lackner and people from their teams. It's really great to see uh, how they react to, to developers' feedback and to all the problems. And you, you can even get, uh, I won't say classified information, but they, they have a tendency to say what's going to coming out in the next version of Swift. It's really, really cool. Well, if you want to contact me, my Twitter handle. Hope you liked it. If you have any questions.